Peter chapter 1 verse 13. As you're turning there, uh, we are starting our new series, The Promise, uh, Our Savior Has Come. Amen? Amen. I'm excited about that. And um, God was offering His people hope in Isaiah chapter 9. He was promising a light that would come to expel the darkness. Are you grateful for that this morning? Amen. Expel the darkness. Now, Simeon, we'll be talking about him, has an encounter with the baby Jesus, which is the fulfillment of God's promise to bring salvation to all the people. Simon had the audacity to hope that God would come through even after years of waiting. Isn't that interesting? Uh, God gives us a promise, and many times in Scripture, uh, we see that people get impatient. They get tired of waiting around. But Simeon, uh, even though he had to wait, Simeon was faithful. And uh, he was faithful and, and waited. Now, we'll discover a God who keeps his promises. Uh, these promises are what gives us hope. Gives us hope, a peace, and a joy. Amen? When I can read God's word and see all the promises that God has kept, I can know that I can count promises that are yet to come. I know that I serve a God that keeps his word. These promises that give us hope, peace, and joy and love, which all lead us back to the manger where we meet our Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're literally uh, weeks away. We're literally weeks away from the most wonderful time of year. Christmas is coming. It's hard to believe Christmas 2021 uh, is so close. I feel like I'm still stuck in uh, 2020 of January or March. You know what I mean? Still trying to figure everything out. Um, does anyone here like to get ready for Christmas early? Do we have those people in our church? Uh, okay. Uh, you start decorating your house. Anybody decorate before Thanksgiving? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, just start kind of getting it ready a little bit. It's interesting. Uh, I'll tell you a little secret about the Smiths. We are terrible. We're terrible. We don't do, like, any decorations. Do you know what the decoration in our house will be this year? A pineapple. <laughs> that will be our Christmas tree. I don't know where that comes from. Living at it somewhere, something. Pineapple for a Christmas tree. Isn't that awful? I feel bad. I'm like, I'm terrible. But, you know, we're not here for Christmas. And, you know, we have to leave and go see family. And I don't know what it is about putting up decorations and taking them down. It just gets on my everlasting nerve. I don't know what it is. Uh, it just brings me no joy. It stresses me out. Uh, even when I see other people's houses that look so beautiful, it stresses me out. I'm like, all that money, all the work, the effort, and everything they got to go through, and all the untangling, because they're going to be tangled up next year, starting in my house, I get stressed out. I, I don't know. Um, but I know there are definitely people out there that they may even be in our church, or you may know somebody that would leave decorations up all year if they could. Uh, maybe you're not that extreme, but uh, most of us can relate to the anticipation of Christmas. Anticipation and the excitement. Uh, does anyone remember making those little paper chains in school? Yeah, you guys remember that? Man, I remember. It felt like forever for Christmas to get here, you know? You take that one chain off and, you know, you, you break it, and then you look at how long the chain was, and you were just like, jeez. It's never going to get here. You know, that excitement and uh, that building up and uh, that appreciation. Um, you know, you try to sleep on Christmas Eve. You don't have good luck as a kid, you know. Uh, how many of you as a kid tried to stay up all night long Christmas Eve? Would you try that? I never made it very far. Never made it very far. Um, but, you know, that's part of the magic of Christmas, the anticipation uh, in it of the day in itself. Um, the truth is, waiting isn't easy. Um, you know, waiting can be very difficult for us. You know, we, we, we definitely live in a society of uh, quick gratification, amen? We, we can get just about anything uh, right away. I want a milkshake at 3 o'clock in the morning. There's somewhere that will give me a milkshake. Who does that? Put their pajamas on and go get a milkshake at 3 o'clock in the morning. Amen, amen. God bless America is all I can say. Uh, capitalism. If you want something, there's someone out there willing to provide it to you. Now, hope. Hope is a word we use often during the Christmas season. Um, you know, I hope the tree fits. I hope I get what I want for Christmas. 
I hope Lacey's picking up all my hints that I'm dropping. I hope it snows this year. Uh, we have a lot of uh, depth in the theme of hope. But when our hopes are really just wishful thinking about trivial things, about how many, how many spouses in here uh, really shop, you really buy presents for Christmas? Spouse. You buy something for your spouse. Not a lot. That's, okay, somewhat, yeah. Lacey and I are kind of like, what do you want? I'm like, what do I want? And then we pretty much should just go get it. You know what I mean? So we don't really have a big emphasis on, you know, I don't try to get a great thought of what I'm going to get Lacey for Christmas. She doesn't either. Oftentimes, we just buy something together. You know what I mean? Uh, we'll, we'll take both of what we want. So it's interesting uh, that a lot of you like putting in this great thought. but And that's good. I think that's great things. I tell Lacey all the time, you got me, you're blessed enough. Amen? <laughs> um, but, you know, with the hopes, we, we put so much hope in trivial things that we've really lost uh, thought of what real hope is. This, however, uh, is not Scripture's understanding of the word hope. In 1 Peter, the writer uses the word hope over and over. In chapter 1, we're given a bit of summary of this word. Now, let's go ahead and read there in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. It says, Wherefore, gird up your loins of your mind. Isn't that interesting? Gird up your loins. What in the world does that mean? We'll talk about it. But be sober and hope to the end of the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now let's take a minute and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you speak to our hearts and minds this morning. Help us to get closer into your word. Help us to grow as a church family, uh, to grow closer to one another. And God, we just thank you so much how you have blessed our church. In Jesus' name, amen. So when we look at hope, what is hope? Um, most of the time when we talk about hope, it's in terms of the future. Uh, but it also has a lot to do with the present. Peter uses the phrase, with minds that are sober. Minds that are sober. Now the phrase comes from an ancient, uh, um, girding up your loins, it comes from a, an ancient form of dress men wore in the Middle East. Uh, men would wear a long outer shirt that would stretch all the way down to their ankles. This made it pretty, uh, pretty difficult to move really fast. Uh, you know, uh, how many of you have ever wore long jean dresses and tried to run in that? It's pretty difficult, right? I mean, I'm not speaking from experience, but I've heard that. I've heard that. I've heard that. That's what I've always been told. So to gird up your loins meant you would grab the bottom of it, tuck it into your belt, and you would be ready for action. So Peter's telling people, wherefore, gird up your loins of your mind. He's saying, get ready for action. Be sober and hope. Have that hope, uh, put faith in that hope, until the end of the grace that is to be brought unto you, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, our hope is not just meant to be something that only impacts our future, uh, but it should impact our present as well. As we recognize that our future is shaped by our present, we should be fully aware of both. Hope means that we are fully prepared for what is to come, both in the present and in the future. You see, if we live our lives based on uh, that hope that we have in the future, that will dictate how we live our lives in the present. What you believe about God, uh, of God keeping his promises, will dictate how you live your life uh, in the present. Hope is certainly about the future, but it definitely impacts the present. Our hope is not set in some optimism for no reason. Our hope is set in specific moments of history. For example, the arrival of Jesus Christ as a baby and his life, his death, and his resurrection were moments in history. Hope is about living right now in light of the future promise. Amen? Let me say that again. Let me make sure that sinks in. I need that to sink in good. I need that to sink in. Hope is about living right now in light of the future promise. I don't like fall, but I really don't like winter. I can tell you that. I, I'm pretty much ready for spring right now. I've had enough of fall and winter. I know some of you just love fall and you think it's so great. Now, with anticipation, though, I have to say I do love bow fishing this time of year. I don't know what it is, but the big fish come out. I'm dying on Facebook every day I get on there. There's a memory where I shot a big fish last year. 
And I just, I get excited for that. And I know some of you deer season, as soon as the fall starts coming in, your brain just goes, deer season's on its way. Amen. Deer season's on its way, yes. So I know we got that. But that anticipation. Now, a mark of almost every person within the Christmas story that you're going to see is that they were full of hope because they were full of hope about the fulfillment of a promise. Okay? That was their hope, was the fulfillment of the promise. Now, that hope that they had in the fulfillment of the promise dictated how they lived their life today. Isaiah chapter 9 says, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, and they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath that light shined. And that's that hope. Okay? Meaning that when before we've accepted Christ, we live our lives in darkness, and we see the light in a sense, amen, when we come to accept Christ. Now, the Old Testament holds many prophe uh, promises and prophecies, uh, many uh, specifically about the coming Jesus. Each one helps sustain the Jewish people because they believed a rescue was coming. It helped them live day to day because they believed a rescue was coming. When they met with difficult days and uh, difficult times, they just remembered a rescue is coming coming. And that helped them to get over many things. Now there was an old man named Simeon within the passages of scripture. Simeon is a wonderful character as he is a perfect example of someone who oriented his life around the future promise that God had given. You see, Simeon oriented the present, what he was doing right now, based on the promise that was to come. Isaiah chapter 9 uh, would, have, uh, uh, would have been a centering prayer for Simeon after Jesus' birth, Mary and Joseph, Jesus' parents, took their newborn son, newborn son to the temple to participate in the traditional Jewish custom of the day. One of the main reasons to travel to the temple was to dedicate or consecrate your baby to Jesus. We do that here at our church. We have baby dedication. I'm excited for baby Lena. And uh, I'm not going to say the name for the other baby just yet. I don't know if she's told everybody. But I do know the name. I'm pretty excited about it, too. And I'm excited to see them be dedicated and given back to the Lord. And so this is what Mary and Joseph were doing. They traveled to the temple. And guess who was there? Simeon was there. Now, why is that important? Go to Luke chapter 2, verse 25. Luke chapter 2, verse 25. So, but Mary and Joseph, they travel with the baby Jesus. And they go there to dedicate him to the Lord, and Simeon is there. Luke chapter 2, verse 25. Living our lives uh, in the present with the focus on what's coming in the future will change how you live your life today. So in verse 25, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout. Man, if that could only be said about us. Amen. Waiting for the line of the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. Now think about that. So Simeon has received a promise. And that promise dictated how Simeon lived his life day to day. Because he said, I've received this promise. I know that these things are to come, and I'm going to make sure that I continue to live a just and a righteous life. It says in verse 27, he came up by the spirit of the temple, and uh, when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, verse 28, then took he up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. Isn't that interesting? He starts off, Simeon starts off with saying, Now I can depart in peace because I've seen the Lord. Okay? He said, Mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all thy people, and a light, uh, or excuse me, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and uh, his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed him and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again for many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce uh, through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. 
Isn't that interesting? Simeon lived his life based on that promise and that dictated how he lived in the present because he knew of the future things that were to come. According to uh, Luke 2, Simeon was promised that he would not die until he saw the Messiah in the flesh. His life would be spared until he set eyes on the anointed one. And that dictated how Simeon lived his life because he knew of the promises and he put his hope and a seriousness in those promises. By the prompting of the spirit, spirit, spirit uh, Simeon is at the temple at the time Jesus and his family arrive. When Simeon sees Jesus, he knows immediately who he is. He's overcome by joy and a hope as he realizes that this is the one he's been waiting for. The one who the world has been waiting for. And Simeon takes the baby Jesus into his arms and recites that beautiful prayer. Can you even imagine what Simeon would have felt? Think about it. For one, on one hand, Simeon knows... I can now go be with the Lord. Now, most of us would say, well, now that means Simeon's going to die. He would be sad about that. No. Simeon is like, hey, I can leave this earth now. God has kept his promise with me. I mean, when you think about the very fact of, of seeing and understanding so well God giving his promise to you and delivering that, what that would mean to you. Amen? How great that would be. And see, we, we, we forget about the promises that we have, and we get a little discouraged because we feel like we don't have this promise that Simeon had received. But really, we do. Amen? If you simply think about your lives, uh, I can look back on my life and feel that God is so close with me or God is so real because of the changes that he made in my life. Amen? I can think about how different God has made me and changed me, and that shows me that God does keep his promises and keeps them fulfilled. Yes. To know that the thing that he had hoped for for so long had come to pass. Simeon in many years had, been, uh, had, had seen many painful times in Israel's history. He saw the Romans conquer and occupy his people and his land. He saw bloody civil war. He saw multiple revolutions uh, by the Israelite people be crushed. Yet in the midst, he believed that God was not done and did not quit on them. He believed the Messiah, the Deliverer, was still on his way. Simeon received that promise, and it dictated how he lived in the present, even though he saw so many things that would discourage him. Simeon saw many bad things happen to Israel, but Simeon knew there was a Savior that was going to come, and it was going to change Simeon's life, and it was going to change the people of Israel. Amen? Amen. Simeon knew these things. He believed in it, and the promise that he received dictated how he lived in the present. In Luke chapter 2, Simeon stands at the temple holding the promised Messiah, the one who through the world would be rescued. Simeon shows us that our hope is birthed out of a deep longing and desperate need for God's presence and comfort in our life. Luke tells us that Simeon was waiting for the temple for something very specific. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now, the word consolation means encouragement or comfort. You see, Simeon went to the temple faithfully because Simeon knew the Savior was going to come. The word that Luke uses in the, in the, uh, the waiting of this passage in the Greek word is uh, um, a word I'm not even going to try to pronounce. But it literally means to give access to oneself. It's a kind of waiting you do from the deepest part of yourself. It's the waiting that involves almost a sort of pain as you begin to wait and long. God wants us to be longing for his return. Amen? God wants us to be longing for Jesus to come back. and God wants us to be longing for the rapture to take place. God wants us to be longing for us to be with him. And that doesn't mean that God wants us to end our lives prematurely. Absolutely not. We know that something like that, a thought like that, is only from the devil. So why did Simeon get it right when so many people got it wrong? In short, it's because the people were looking for something that Jesus wasn't. Jesus wasn't what most people were looking for in the Messiah. They wanted a political warrior king. That would overthrow their oppressors of the Jews and put the Jews on the top. They wanted him to vanquish their enemies. 
They wanted Jesus to be this great ruler that would come down and strike fear into the hearts of their enemies. And how does Jesus come? In the most innocent, precious way, in the form of a baby. And then not only does he come not to crush Israel's enemies, Jesus comes to die for their enemies. They, they were upset and they rejected Jesus because he didn't come to solve all their problems. I can tell you this greatly goes against prosperity gospel. Amen? Amen. Amen. They, they wanted Jesus to make them wealthy, their nation to be the most powerful nation on the planet. And Jesus comes and says, I've come to die for you for your sins. And they said, that's not good enough. Think about that. They said, that's not good enough. Jesus says, I'm here to die for your sins. I'm here to die for you. And they said, that's not good enough. For the people that missed Jesus, it was because their hope were in specific expectations. Their expectations were what about what they wanted God to be. They wanted God or they wanted Jesus to look a certain way, to act a certain way. Uh, they wanted Jesus to do everything to change in their favor. We see many churches and denominations and many people doing this today. It's always interested me when I have people quote me in the Bible. I can always tell almost right away if they've actually read all of it. Like especially when someone says, judge not lest you be judged. I know immediately they, they don't know what the next five verses say. They've completely missed the whole meaning of that verse. We see today people try to pick and choose uh, of where God, uh, who God is. They say, we know from Scripture God tells us what is right and what's, what's wrong. Uh, it's interesting to me when many times I've heard people talk about sin and say, I prayed about it. I prayed about it. It's always, I've always found that fascinating. But we convince ourselves uh, better than anybody else. You see, they wanted to dictate uh, who Jesus was, and they want to pick and choose. But Simeon recognized the promise that he had received. And that promise of the future dictated how he lived in the present. This morning, in the midst of whatever you're going through, where do you find hope? How you answer that question, it makes all the difference. Is your hope based on something that you want God to do, or is it based on who God is. Is that you, how you put your hope? Is your hope on what you want God to do, or is your hope based on who God is? It's like a couple that finds out they're pregnant. John and Renee definitely went through this, and Luke and Danielle are still going through it. The nine months to wait seems like it takes forever. For me, I feel like Renee just told us last month she was pregnant. It flew by for me. But for her, I'm sure it was very different. And I remember Lacey being pregnant with Lydia and Liam and the excitement, the anticipation of what was to come, and being impatient. And it felt like it took forever. All they could do is wait for the arrival of the coming child, but then again, they have we have plenty to do to make sure that we're prepared. Amen? I talked to John and Renee and Luke and Daniel as they prepare. They have to be prepared for when that baby finally shows up. They've had to paint rooms, buy clothes, try to get sleep, baby-proof the house. I remember uh, every corner in our house, my mother-in-law made me put something round on it uh, because our kids were going to get hurt somehow. And we bought gates, and we put gates almost out of every single room. Lydia was an expert of getting out of gates. I mean, she was a professional. Uh, every gate we put up, she somehow figured out how to climb over. And I remember the first time we bought this gate, uh, it was pretty tall. It was about that tall. And the bars went straight up and down. Because she would use her toes, and, you know, she'd climb over the gates. She climbed over every gate we had. And I remember looking over, and she had this little shopping cart. And this, this is what she gets from her mom. This attitude. And so she tried to climb that gate at first and she couldn't get over it. And she was ramming the shopping cart into the gate trying to open that gate. Now I will tell you, that gate didn't work either. Lydia somehow figured out that if she stuck the bars in between her toes, that she could still shimmy up over that gate. And that is a real deal. I could just absolute disbelief 
Lydia still could get over that game. But as we, we try to make all these preparations, and I know you guys did the same thing, many of you, as you prepared, and, and, and you prepared on that promise of what was to come. When, uh, similarly, when we have hope that Jesus is going to show up on our life, we've got plenty to do to join him in his work. Amen? If you would, go ahead and stay with me this morning. And just as the music plays, I'd just like for you to think about we have this promise. We've been given this promise that Jesus is going to come back. Jesus is going to come back. We know that all, we, when we think about all the promises that have been